everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And hold on a second. I forgot to move my mic again. All right, today I'm going to tackle this uh, uh, very, very famous, well, this famous story uh, by a man by the name of Frank Abagnale. Okay, Frank Abagnale. <laughs> it's hard to say his name. And he this, this movie was done about him, Catch Me If You Can, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, Tom Hanks, and it is a super fun movie. People love this movie. It, it was a huge, it was a huge hit. And it says, if you watch the movie, that it's based on a true story, only it's not. It's not based on a true story. This is fiction. And the story it's based on? is this story called Catch Me If You Can, written by Frank Ab Abagnale and his co-author. And it's it's subtitled The True Story of a Real Fake. No, it's a fake story of a pretty crappy fake, actually, which is why he ended up in prison like six times. He wasn't that good at what he did. But <laughs> he ended up becoming quite wealthy and extremely popular. And was on all uh, just a television show after television show, super popular. And then his book came out. He, look at that, New York Times bestseller. And then it became a movie. This guy is a con man. Frank Abagnale is not only a con man. He conned everybody up that he was that good a con man. <laughs> but he had help. And the help comes from another conning group, which is called the media. The media were the biggest cons of all. And that's what I'm going to get into today. So um, I want to welcome everybody who is in the chat room. Um, and if you'd like to be in the chat room, please do click the link below. And you can join Patreon, which is very helpful to this educational channel. Um, five bucks a month. Be at all the live shows. Be part of the community. Click below. Uh, please do subscribe to the channel. I'd I have to say this over and over again because it's funny. If you don't have one of those little, like it's, some of these, uh, if you edit your shows and you don't have them live, they got this nice little, like little rectangle here that says click on this and and people jump right on it and subscribe. But if you don't have that, it, people subscribe less because it takes more work. So guys, right below <laughs> is a thing that says subscribe. Click on that. Uh, please subscribe to the channel. Like. Check all my playlists, hit the bell for notifications, and support the educational channel. And uh, also, I have my books below, and there's a little dollar sign to support, a one-time support, if you can do so. All right, that is my spiel on that, because I'm trying to keep the channel going and keep educating people, and not just telling a story. But Because <laughs> I'm not just going to tell the story of this guy. I want to tell you the truth about this guy, and the truth about the media, and how all of this plays together and how you get played as a fool. All right. And a lot of times people don't even care if they're being played as long as they're being amused. And we have a very, very uh, big problem with people liking to amuse themselves rather than people wanting to learn, to be educated, to do the right thing and all of this. And it, it, it's a real, it's a real shame. So that's what I'm going to get into now. Who is this guy? Frank Ab I can't, it's really hard to say the guy's name, Abagnail, Abag, Abagnail. And it's funny because in the movie, he actually pretends to be a teacher, which probably he didn't do, but they put that in the movie as a teenager. And he goes up pretending he's a substitute and he puts on the board, Mr. And he goes, A-B-A-G-N-A-L-A-L-E. And it's Abagnail, not Abagnail, or and he tells him, a couple other different versions. So I actually had to go back and play that like a few times so I could say Abignail because it is just doesn't roll off the tongue. Okay, Frank Abignail. Let's just call him Frank the Con. All right. I got a lot of other words for him. But because um, I, I really, really dislike this guy immensely, immensely dislike him. And I dislike the people who have given him the platform that they gave him all these years. So let me go to now. Who is this guy? I'll give you the very, very, very beginning of Wikipedia on him, just so you have a clue. That is him about age 20. And these are a few other pictures of him at various ages. And that is the wife he is now married to, because there's a there's a fool if I've ever seen one. But maybe 
she ended up rich. So, okay. But you're, you're married to a psychopath. So I don't have a lot of sympathy for you or anything you go through. Or the fact that you would even stand by this guy. I don't know. Maybe you're divorced him by now. But you had three kids with him. So what's wrong with you? Anyway, who is Frank Abagnale? All right. He was born in 1948. This, and it really bugs me the way they start off, is an American author. That's not his claim to fame. All right. He's not really an author. He 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 found a, a publishing company who would publish a book, and he had a co-author. And I, I I had one on one of my books too. I was kind of forced into it. But to call yourself an author, make to me mean has some meaning. When you he just wrote he just wrote with the help a book of lies. That doesn't make you an author. It just makes you a con again. Um, and he's a convicted felon many times over. Ab Abagnale targeted individuals and small businesses. Yes, he did. And I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and he gained, later gained notoriety in the 1970s by claiming a diverse range of workplace frauds, many of which have since been placed in doubt. Okay, this is where Wikipedia, whoever wrote this stuff, is, is being careful. No, they haven't been placed in doubt. They've been proven to be complete lies. Not doubts, lies. 100% proven. Let me go back here to mention this guy. So I read this book. I did watch the movie again, which is still entertaining in spite of it being a pa pack of lies. Um, the Greatest Hoax on Earth, written by a guy named Alan Logan. Now, he worked with people who knew him, and then he worked with the information from other journalists, and he really did a lot of work. As a matter of fact, the book is extremely long. I made it halfway through, um, and... It was well written. There's nothing wrong with it, but there's so much information about how much how, how much of a lying piece of crap this guy is. It goes on and on and on and on with all his frauds and lies. It's and but they're not they're not amazing frauds. They're just little pieces of garbage. And this is why I think it's it really annoys me that he's been built up to be this super clever guy. And I'm going to prove to you he's not super clever in any of the actual con games he did to before he met the media, all right? But this guy wrote a really good book and he has detailed this to, I mean, massive detail in here. I recommend if you really wanna know what this piece of garbage is I'm really about, read that book, okay? I'll link that one below. Um, so yeah, so what happened is he became, um, he started to become very, very popular because of the media. Um, he wrote a book, and then uh, the book inspired the film of the same name, directed by Steven Spielberg. So, shame on you, Steven Spielberg. In 2002, in which Abagnale was portrayed by actor Leonardo DiCaprio, who also thinks he's the greatest guy ever. Shame on you, Leonardo DiCaprio. And he has also written four other books. Oh, really? Um, and he runs the Abagnale and Associates a consulting firm which pretty much anybody can run a consulting firm. And if anybody hires this guy from now on out, you're an idiot and despicable. Because you, it's just, it's, it's super sad. That's all I can say. Okay, let me, let me tell you a little bit about this, this guy. All right. All right. So let me show you some of the things this guy has said. I'm going to stop with uh, Wikipedia right now. I just want to put out in front of you so you can see what this guy claimed. All right. When I was 16 years old, I successfully uh, pretended to be an airline pilot for Pan American Airlines until I was 18. That's garbage. He didn't do that till he was 20 and he never actually flew on a, he didn't actually fly a plane. This is one of the first things people think. Uh, he did admit he didn't ever fly as a pilot. He just purchased a, an out, a pilot's outfit and he forged an ID and he went in the jump seat. That's all he did. And actually, the one thing that they show in the movie is that he goes the first time he's doing this, he's in the, you know, right up there in the cockpit, sitting in the jump seat. He wasn't. He was in the back because he didn't want to answer any questions because he couldn't answer any questions because he's not a pilot. But he pretended he did this when he was a teenager. He did not. So that's a, that's a lie right there. Um, he did it a number of times, but not nearly as much as he claims. Like he flew all over the world doing this constantly. No, he didn't. Um, at the age of 18, I became the chief resident pediatrician of a Georgia hospital where I practiced medicine there for about a year. Get out of here. No, you didn't. 
That, it was never hired by the hospital. There was no such, that never happened, period. Never happened. That's just a complete, complete falsehood. At the age, uh, let's see, at the age of 19, having never been to law school in my life, I took the state bar exams in the state of Louisiana. I passed the bar and became a licensed attorney. Before my 19th birthday was over, I was appointed the assistant attorney general of the state where I practiced law in that position for about a year. Big fat lie. Never passed the bar. Never worked as an attorney. Never, certainly not worked as with attorney general. Bull crap. 100% a big fat lie. And yet this is, this is what he put out there and this is what people believed. Um, at the age of 20, I was a college professor at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. I taught two full semesters there as a PhD. No, he didn't. They never had him. He would never taught anything at that university. And they said they had a good enough uh, procedure so that he couldn't possibly have gotten hired. So, no, he never did that either. Um, I was old enough to drink. Before I was old enough to drink, I was a millionaire twice over. Get out of here. No, you weren't. You became pretty well off after you started telling the story to the media and the media made you famous. That's when you made your money. Before then, you didn't have, you didn't hardly ever had any money. That's a bull crap. He hard, had no money to speak of, except little bits that he, he uh, cashed bad checks, um, forgeries, and he'd get a hundred or 200 dollars. That's it. And he steal people's cars and he'd rip people off. That's how he, that's how he got his money. But he's never had very much money at all. All right. Then he says this. Um, I didn't keep any books, but the FBI says I cashed two point five million dollars worth of fraudulent checks. That figure sounds reasonable. The FBI never said that and he never did that. He only can it's only like 10 checks. But he claims there are 17,000 checks. But, you know, how it's like I think he said 17,000 checks. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, uh, uh, like many other articles and orations that would follow, Abagnale characteristically dropped influential names to add credence to his story. This created the illusion that he was merely repeating what purportedly Pan Am says, the FBI says, the New York Times says, the Wall Street Journal says. In Ab Abagnale's world, a lot of people are same. And that is a contract because you can question him, but can you question somebody saying that about him? So if I say... Um, I've worked, I've worked 200, I've solved 200 cases that I've profiled. You might go, really? Do you have proof of that? But if I say, uh, the FBI has stated that I, that I solved 200 cases, even though I wasn't working with them, they recognize that I've solved 200 cases. Are you going to connect, call, call the FBI up and try to get that info from them? Or are you going to think, oh, well, the FBI said it must be true. <laughs> Very clever. That is how a con works. All right. Now, this is something else he said. With my photographic memory, I can easily memorize anything. They arranged an interview for me before a panel of six doctors. I passed. The rest was easy. No, there was never a panel of six do doctors. No one ever. He didn't have to know anything because he actually never had these jobs. Now, this is something people don't seem to realize because he's claimed to have been a lawyer, a doctor, a professor, all of these things. People assume he must be brilliant because he was able to fool people. No, he was never any of these things ever. He was never a pilot. He didn't have to pretend he could fly. He was never a doctor, so he didn't have to know any medical terms. He had not to know anything and he didn't know anything. He was a little dumb ship. I think he was. He was a dumb ship. He barely, I don't even know if he could, did he get out of high school or did he ran away before he got out of high school? I can't even remember. But he had, no, he had no college experience and he never read that much. He was basically running around pretending. That's it. And he wasn't that good. But if you can find people and he wasn't he wasn't going before super educated people. He played people who had soft hearts and they could have been educated, but he wasn't going before doctors and lawyers and pilots. He wasn't talking to them. He was just talking to regular people on the street. Somebody might have uh, say a pastor. Pastor wouldn't know about these other things, so he might go, "Okay, seems like a, he seems like it could be that." Or somebody who works has a, has a small business, they might believe, you know, if he says, "I'm a pilot with Pan Am," they're not going to question him. Well, tell me about the fuselage of the airplane. You know, 
they're not going to ask them those questions. So you can get away with it because you actually never have to show any of your knowledge of these topics. So bull crap. He, he's, there was no brilliance in him at all. I, 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 you know, the only brilliance he's got is he's a con artist and he knows how to fool people. I'm going to get into how a con artist works. All right. Well, I'm the youngest man ever confined behind the walls of the Atlanta federal pen. It had never had an escape there since 1902. I was there 13 days when I became the first man ever to escape from the Atlanta federal penitentiary. Get out of here. No, he didn't escape from there. That's another lie that he'd love you to believe. Mm -hmm. All right. And then he said, I was proud of the fact that I never swindled an individual, just companies that could afford it. Big fat lie. He swindled a lot of regular people. That's where he really got his money from, was swindling small businesses. You know, hey, can I borrow your car and not bring it back? You know, those kind of things. Um, I always avoided small merchants. Not true. I would never cash a check in a mom and pop store. Not true. But rather against banks and airlines where I thought it really wasn't hurting them. Not true. Um so, so essentially, this is what happened. Frank Abagnale, oh, wait, Ab Abagnale, sorry, I said it wrong, would soon become famous for what he didn't do. When he walked out of prison in 1973, he was still a stranger to the world. So he got famous for what he didn't do, not for what he did do. Very interesting. Now he says this. He, later on, he says, there's no words to express how sorry I am. I cannot ask for forgiveness. I guess I just deserve the 10 years you promised me. This is somewhere along the way where he ripped people off. And finally, this pastor who had got suspicious of him turned him in and, and found out he had ripped off all these nice people. Okay, And um, what he had done uh, here in this, in, which you'll see um, in in the movie is how he does women just adore him and they're just all over him because he's just so sexy. And, you know, he's, he's the James Bond of pilots or whatever. Um, what he really did was he stalked this woman. Her name was Paula Parks. She was with Delta airlines. He stalked the crap out of her, freaked her out completely. She said he smelled weird. Um, she didn't like being around him and he kept saying, I'll drive you here and I'll drive you there. And she just was totally creeped out. And sometimes she she tried to placate him, which she should never do. And, and so she, he, she, he drove her home to her family. And this is her family. This is her, her dad. And um, that's her mom, both soft-hearted Southerners down in uh, Louisiana. And um, they really liked him because he's a con artist. And he made them feel good. And he said sweet things and all that. And she never dated him, ever. She told him she was not going to have anything to do with him. She went away and she would call back to her house and she found out he was staying with them. <laughs> not only staying with them, she goes, don't tell me he's sleeping in my bed. And they said, well, yes, she was totally creeped out. She said, what the heck? So while he was down there staying with them and taking advantage of them and stealing checks from them, which they didn't realize till later, he was also, here he is. This is um, him at that, uh, at the parks residence, 20, 21 years old. And this is some, one of the um, local women he was dating um, and this car did not belong to him, but he had it. <clears throat> so anyway, this pastor, he was trying to get a job from this pastor and because he said he didn't want to be a pilot anymore. He'd rather help children. <laughs> sure. You're going to give up your, your big job as a pilot so you can do a job that, he, Oh, he, I think he claimed he had a degree in social work by then. So, so this guy was looking around, but he got suspicious of him. So he ended up, turning men to the police and that big speech he gave was because he ripped off all these people and he actually got the pastor to feel sorry for him. And the pastor believed he was remorseful. Let's see how that goes. Let me see if I can read this to you. So he got him to believe he was remorseful and he said, I cannot ask for forgiveness. And I guess I just deserve the 10 years you promised me. However, I want you to please understand that I have no control over what I did. I love you all so very much. And the last thing I want to do is hurt one of you. I'll never forget what I did. I think of that 24 hours a day. I'll be sorry for the rest of my life. You people have showed me more love in six weeks than I ever saw in my lifetime. Even though I will go to prison, every cent I owe you will be repaid. I will have to live with what I've done. That to me is worse than any jail. I'm sorry. God is my judge. Pastor fell for it. Do you think you ever paid those people back? Hell no. Yeah, and he got a really reduced sentence, so he, he spent very little time in jail. Um, and then he said again here, I never committed any violent crimes. I never, ever ripped off any individuals. Lie. I don't feel any guilt. 
because you're a psychopath. Um, now, because I paid back all the money, lie, because you're a psychopath. I returned all the money I stole, lie, because you're a psychopath. I was under no legal obligation to do so, lie. He was under legal obligation to do so, but he never did it. No one is out one dime because of the crimes I've executed 20 years ago. Big fat lie. Nice fella, huh? Really nice fella. So he never did any of the fancy stuff you see in the film. He didn't. He, he, all of that stuff is fake. And then, you know, he eventually claims that he works for the FBI, that first of all, that the FBI chased him for five years. And that's, that's in the film. Oh my God, they're chasing him across the, you know, into France and everything, finally getting a hold of him. And, but he makes good friends with this FBI agent. Yeah. Um, and then he, because he makes good friends with him and the FBI agent realizes he's remorseful and a very smart guy, they hire him for the FBI. And he's been working to the, for the FBI ever since. But the FBI won't admit it because they don't want to look stupid or he's working undercover or whatever the hell the story is. He doesn't work for the FBI. And they didn't chase him for five years. As a matter of fact, he was so unimportant. No, the fact that he claimed he was on their 10 most wanted list is garbage. They didn't even know who the hell he was, really. They had some local FBI guy going, somebody's passing some bad checks. Nobody was chasing him across the world. He was a little, little small time loser, dude. Very small time loser. And he would, so he never committed any of these big crimes. He got put away like six times, I think it was. Uh, let's see, where did he get put in, put in prison? Let me see if I can find it. Because he only claims he was ever in jail once. And he was in the worst French prison ever for six months where he stayed in a hole. This is, that was a lie. He was there for three months and it wasn't in that bad shape. That's another lie. Um, where's this stuff about where he's, um, oh yeah. In his public lectures describing his life story, Abagnale has consistently maintained he was, quote, arrested just once. And that was in Montpellier, France. However, public records show Abagnale was arrested in New York multiple times, California, Massachusetts, Louisiana, Georgia, and Texas. And for all for shitty little crimes. Because he didn't do anything that fancy. Um, so the amount of money he actually, let's see, um, the claim that he got, oh, yeah. He claimed he cashed over 17,000 bad checks amounting to 2.5 million. And that's all garbage. I suppose it was, I think it was 10 checks. And I think the total was like 1,500. So you see, he is just a big fat liar. But, but why the heck is he getting all that attention? Well, let's, let's look at how he got there. Here he is. I'm so, let me see if I can find him. Where are you? Uh, Oh, here we go. To tell the truth. He gets on to tell the truth in 1977. And these three, you know, this is where you go and three people say they're Frank Ab Abagnale and two of them are pretending and the other one is a real one. And all four judges, the you know, celebrity judges, guess the wrong people. And he, nobody guessed that he was actually Frank Abagnale. And so he won. <laughs> and so what happened was somehow the he got there. And they didn't do due diligence to find out who he was. So he got there. And you see, he got on Johnny Carson. You see? Oh, and then he got his book. He got, there he is with Leonardo DiCaprio. He became famous, especially from Johnny Carson's show. He went over on that more than once. More than once. So uh, before I go to the media aspects, of why the media essentially were, were accessories in crime. They were accessories in the crime of telling lies to the public for their own purposes. Now, by, by, I'll just let Johnny Carson off the hook. He is a host of a show. He had people come on a show. He did not do the, the, the checking. The checking is done through the people who bring the people on. Okay. And I'm going to talk about how that happens because I certainly know because I've been brought on TV that way myself. So it wasn't his fault. He's just believing what his people did. He's thinking they did due diligence. They're putting on somebody they're telling them they're telling the truth about the guy he's going to have on the show. And so there he is on the show doing his thing. And he was invited over and over and over again. At some point, Johnny found out this guy was a fraud and wouldn't wouldn't deal with him anymore. But he still got on twice with a guest host because the audience loved it. So before I get on to the media's role in all of this and how they are some of the biggest con artists ever, I want to talk about how people con. Because. The media can't do what the media does if people aren't willing to be conned. 
And you have to figure out, and also not understanding how they're being conned and why they're being conned. So I'm going to go to that next. And I'm going to check your some of your comments here. Um, he, he claimed he was in witness protection. Uh, I, I must have missed that lie. <laughs> no, he was not in that. Uh, that's for sure. Um, uh, Tikkun says, hi, Tikkun. The FBI was not chasing him. He wasn't working for nearly three years as a doctor, lawyer, and professor. He was for the most part behind bars. Exactly. Very good. He was pretty much that. <laughs> yeah, he is a jerk. But you say, what a charmer. Okay, you're throwing up. But actually, the one thing he did have going for him was a thing called charm. And, and if you actually look at him, and listen to him on the show or the other things he's doing, it comes across very, very well. Because you, you cannot be a good con artist if you can't do that. And I'm going to talk about two other people that I know. And I'm going to show you how that works with them as well. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> Bali says, and at the age of three, I cured cancer, started an international $20 billion company, and was secretly the first astronaut to travel to Mars and back for NASA. I'm pretty sure he said that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, Jill says, I read that he put his own account number and deposit slips. He left in the bank in order that other making, others making deposits put their money in his account. Uh, could be. Uh, he did, the things he did were, were he did do some uh, counterfeiting kind of things. Uh, they weren't overly brilliant. In the, in the movie, they have him, get this one. In the movie, they have him in France working off of a, a machine that, it's like this best machine ever made. And he's somehow in some private location with this print printing machine, which, you know, that's how they track him down because it's only like a few in the world and one is in France. And he's in there and there's money flying all over. I mean, these checks are flying all over the room and that's how he gets caught. Got out of here. He didn't do anything that fancy. <laughs> that's just, uh, okay. You asked the question and I'm going to help do that. How can one get away with such huge loss? The bigger they are, the more they get away with it. So that's it. Uh, I guess he can't help himself. Of course he can. He's a psychopath. He can help himself very well. He just chooses to do what works for him. Don't ever believe he can't help himself. That's what psychopaths will always say. I, I couldn't help myself. That's why I had to rape women. I couldn't stop myself. No. Psychopaths do not just have some compulsion to do bad things because they'll not, they're very clever not to do bad things right, right in front of a police officer. Or they, where there's witnesses, they plan very carefully when to do those things. Now, if you want to say that they have compulsions, they they want to do these things. Well, you just might as well say every every human being has those compulsions: compulsion to eat chocolate, compulsion to have a drink, compulsion to have sex, compulsion for this, compulsion for that. We'll just we'll just okay. We all have compulsions. We have no control over our lives. Well, you know, when you have a compulsion to eat a piece of chocolate, that's big difference between that and defrauding people. And raping them. <laughs> you know? I mean, one is a compulsion that's very easy to give into. The other one is pretty big. All right. Let me talk about how people get away with this. All right. Let me see now. Uh, hold on a second. I'm going to have to click here a sec. I think that's where I was at. Okay. Um, you know, my, I told you those little pictures on the side here are very small. And it's hard to see them. All right. All right. Uh, oh, uh, this, I just want to point this out before I go on. Rem remember the woman, um, this, this woman, she finally met him years later as he's doing one of his talks. And she actually paid to enter and made her throw up. And she said, he said, yo, I'll sign a book for you, right? And she was hoping she would, like, he would might apologize or something. And then she says this, but the con man had not changed at all. She didn't really know what else she could have expected. Correct. Con artists never change. Change their methodologies. Maybe they slow down as they get older. Other... There's other things they may do, but they're still con artists and they're never going to be remorseful and they're never going to feel bad for anything they have done. She found that out. All right. Let's see what else we got here. OK. OK. Here we go. Now, I forgot to put this one up. Nowadays, uh, Abagnale presents himself as a repented con man and a collaborator of the FBI. Has he actually repented at all or is he still a, com a con man blending truth with lies as best suits his interest? If he has repented, why has he let his book be misrepresented and sold as a true story for the past 40 years? By buying this book as a nonfiction book, you're being conned by Mr. Abagnale. Ab 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 <laughs> okay, on his book, look at what people say. And this is why people get conned. All right, this is from his book. 
five stars. And Frank, we hardly knew you. I reread this book. I reread this book every six to eight months. It's such a fun book to read. Oh my goodness. Um, he has raised enough havoc with banking and police systems in the late 60s and early 70s to make Bernie Madoff look like a teenager. And at the time, Frank was a teenager. Lie. Not one, no wonder Pan Am went out of business. What? Frank was probably one of the main reasons. No, Frank hardly did a thing. All he did was wear, wear, wear a pilot's outfit and get a, get a free flight. If you were relying on the movie version of Catch Me If You Can for the story of Frank Abagnale, you're missing a great deal. There's a great deal of complexity in Mr. Ab Abagnale's life that you're missing. It is a story of how a 16-year-old who looks a lot lower can fool adults and the cops for years. No, he got arrested six times because he did such a shabby job. But it's more than that. It is also the story of being caught and punished in some of the worst prisons in Europe. And get out of here again. One three-month run in France, and he played that one up. And some of the most... Uh, and some of the most humane. Okay, whatever. It is a story of how a boy becomes a man in spite of himself and learns to value himself and others. <laughs> oh my God, I, did you sucker into that? Wow. Okay, the other guy says, stranger than fiction. No, dude, it is fiction. Truly, this story is incredible and beyond belief, but it's also true. No, it's not. It's a big pack of lies. Frank Abagnale conned his way through his late teens and stole a fortune. No, he didn't. While living as a playboy. Not really. His method was simple. He played upon the fact that most people that most people want to believe. That's true. They want to believe that others somehow have grabbed life by the horns and made it to the level where mundane concerns no longer apply. There is some truth to that. Um, people. That's why people like James Bond takes a uh, uh, Robert Wagner takes a thief um, where people can live outside the general rules and they can do it with pizzazz. They can have the fancy car, the good looking clothes. They can have champagne. They can just go any place and people run up and serve them at these restaurants. They can get all the beautiful men and women, whatever. People do love that because most of us are constrained by who we are. Maybe by the fact we're not criminals or psychopaths, by the law, by the simple fact we're probably not rich as crap. Um, and we have to, you know, when we go to a restaurant, we open up the menu and we go, Maybe I won't get the lobster, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, or, you know, we buy clothes from Walmart as opposed to from the best store in New York City. I mean, most people don't have that kind of a thrilling life. And they also like the concept that you don't have to work your butt off to get it. That, you know, because if we know we had to work so hard to get that kind of fancy life, we know we're never going to get there. It's like, well, if I want to make a billion dollars, good Lord, what do I have to do? I'll probably work 80 hours a week, come up with clever ideas, take chances, risk. It's a lot of work. But if I can just get lucky, my winning the lottery would be nice, but if I could just do something sneaky and I could suddenly have this life. So, yes, people find that exciting. Kind of a fantasy thing. Um, and he points this out. Um, uh, put, on a, put on an airline uniform and people will want to believe you. Mm. Likewise, for many other guys, this is set a person apart. This is true. Now, if you want to con somebody, a uniform will do it. Police uniform, pilot uniform, army, air force uniform, some uniform. People are, once you've got the uniform, they recognize you not for yourself, but what you represent, which is whatever organization that is. And for women, especially, a, pi a guy in a pilot's uniform is apparently really, really attractive. So they suck up to that. You know, it's like, oh my God, he's a pilot. You know, uh, same thing being a doctor. If you can put a put a put a title on your name, a, I'm I'm a doctor. Of, I'm a surgeon. Immediately, the woman says, you 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 made it all the way through college. You got your you know you got a doctor before your name. You're a surgeon. You make a crap load of money. You work for some big huge hospital. I wanna I wanna I wanna date you. I'll have sex with you right now. <laughs> You know, with the hope you're going to pick me to be your wife. That's the kind of thing it does. So the way you dress, it, it's really interesting. Have you ever seen one of those things where they got like the homeless dude and he's, they li literally take him off the street. He looks like crap. And they put him in the barber's chair and they shave them all up and they cl clean him up beautifully. Then they put on a nice Italian suit on him and he looks like a million bucks. And I, I'm going to say if that guy walked into a restaurant right then and there with that, that look with that those that clothing, he would have the wait, maitre d' run right up to him and say, sir, do you, you know, please come and sit down because he assumes the guy's money. 
And women will look at him, men will look at him, whatever, and say, well, this guy, this guy's somebody. Clothes does do make the man and woman. Okay, so clothing, uh, a title, um, a cart. Used to be just a business cart. You could go to Kinko's and print them up. Hi, I'm a photographer. And then you could, that's how serial killers got a lot of women. I'm a photographer coming, you know, here's some camera and here's a, here's a cart. Come to my apartment and never be seen again. <laughs> Come to my van, never to be seen again because you have a cart. Nowadays, you can have a website. Because if you have a website, people go to the website and say, oh my goodness, this person is somebody. And now you can publish on Amazon without having a publisher, without having a literary agent. You can just publish on Amazon. And people say, oh my God, they're a published author. You might be only got you know, <laughs> three reviews. It might give you a little hint that they're not really a published author, but you know, self-pubbed. Now, mind you, I like self-publishing. And I have one very successful self-publishing book, self-published book. That's only the truth. My fiction one did very well. Um, and I'm planning to publish more self-published books because I'm tired of dealing with publishers. But I'm going to tell you, because you can do that doesn't mean you're an author. You wrote a, you, you, you wrote a book, you chucked it on Amazon. It's kind of a different thing. But people see that website, book on Amazon. Hey, have a YouTube channel. YouTube channel now. Get on somebody else's YouTube channel because they're always looking for guests. They're not going to look up what you're doing. They throw you on the channel. Now you get credibility because you're on their channel. But this is what people fall for. And so this is what these people reading this book, they figured the book was put out by a major publisher and it got a, and it got a movie done. It must be true or at least mostly true. So people fell for it. Now look at what some other people said. A book of fiction, not a true story. I'm giving this book one star because it's a work of fiction being presented as a true story. It may be based on true facts. No, really, almost zero true facts. All right, so, and Ab Abagnale tries to push this off on the co-writer. I was interviewed by the co-writer only four times. I believe he did a great job telling the story, but he also over-dramatized and exaggerated some of the story. That was his style and what the editor wanted. He always reminded me that he was just telling a story, not writing my biography. Get out of here, again. <laughs> if the story is about you, it should have the truth in it. The fact is you lied to your co-author because he was probably a better writer than you. So he just, you just, he just interviewed you. You told your story, put it all on tape and he wrote the book. Then your, your publisher is supposed to do due diligence and find out whether your story is true. So when I wrote my book, uh, the profiler, let's see here. Um, no, not that's not it. Where where my profile ever go? Um, hold on a second. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Uh -huh, okay, it's missing. Hold on a second. I thought it was on this part. Okay, it might not be there. Nope. Okay. Oh. Okay. I can. You can see it through here. Uh, yes, the book, the profiler. This is my second book. Uh, I my my publisher uh, was a uh, Hyperion. And I went through my literary agent was Jane Distel, the same one put out Obama's book. Jane Distel and, and Hyperion, it was mostly Hyperion, which is HarperCollins. They went, they did do due diligence. I had to send them, send them a whole bunch of, of uh, uh, files. The files showing the police departments, uh, showing the work I did on it. Tons of stuff. As a matter of fact, they had their legal team work on it so long they put the book out late and screwed all my publicity. <laughs> but they should have done that due diligence. They just should have done it like before they lost every, all my publicity because they got it out like a month later. It was ridiculous. But so this guy, um, they didn't do that. They didn't care that he was lying. And that's part of the, the problem we have here with the media. As long as they're making a fortune they don't care. And if he didn't specifically say a libelous thing about another person, okay, he's just telling his exploits. He's not saying, for example, that uh, this person is a, a thief or this person uh, cheated on his wife or this person, uh, whatever. He didn't say the governor of such a, of the state stole money. He's not saying things like that. He's just telling these wild stories. And they don't care because there's no nobody's going to sue them. So they're saying, as long as there's money in it, we're just going to shut the heck up. So anyway, uh, 
this is so you see these interesting things that they said. Um, so then he said this. Uh, all right. So this is great story. When well, then I'm the world's greatest con man. As one gentleman said to me, if you didn't do all those things and you've made all this money, you made in advances, royalties and speaking engagement, then you are, in fact, the world's greatest con man. So it didn't matter if the book was fabricated and his whole story was fabricated. The fact that he got away with it because the media helped him made him an even better con man. Got a point there. But see, he wasn't really a good con man. It's just that the media are bigger con artists than he is. And when you have the support of all the major media, you can get away with these things. So the media is the con artist. The, pe the people who put that book out, con artists. Movie, con artists. The people who put them on the show, con artists. The media are con artists because as long as they make money, they don't care if they're going to push the truth on you or push lies on you to get you to believe it. All right. So now I'm going back to the thing I was waiting for but i really want to get to how people do this so i can then talk about why the media can then you can get away with this in the media all right i want to talk about two people because these are experiences uh you might have seen me do one of these uh hold on a second let me see oh i want to say how how let me see what this says okay um let me talk about this first okay if you, it recently fairly recently there was this, this, all this stuff going around the media about how this guy named Gary Oliva, this creepy dude, claimed that he killed Jean Bonnet Ramsey. And, and he was the writer of The Ransom Note. And he managed to get on all kinds of television because he's a con artist. And then these two people popped up, especially the one on the right, Dr. Mazelle Martin. She supposedly is a hand, hand, she analyzes handwriting, and she analyzed that note and claims that Gary Oliva killed Jean Bonnet Ramsey. And that is, that is, that's what she says. She, I'll, I'll let me, let me rephrase that. She believes he is likely to have, I don't know if she actually said he did it, but the, he, she believes the handwriting matches his. Let me put it that way. So Dr. Moselle Martin shows up on these shows and I'm like, who's Dr. Moselle Martin? Apparently I had forgotten. She had actually contacted me like over a decade ago and I had a couple conversations with her, not knowing who she was. You know, because they try to be pleasant to people. And she says, hi, you know, I'm she's this person who's got this doctor before her name. Well, I went and re I, I saw these red flags went up. So I went and read her book. And I can say she doesn't she didn't get any doctorate. She didn't get a master's degree as far as I can see. I don't see any evidence that she got past community college. I don't see it in her book. I don't see that she did. She said she worked for all these law enforcement agencies. I don't see any proof of that either. She said all these things she said in the book. I mean, the, the book is is like a Frank Abagnale, uh, Abagnale book. She tells these exploits, all these crazy things that happened to her. And then she, you know, weaves in and out that she went to, then she went and got this and she got this job here. And, and she, I think she was in witness protection too. Uh, <laughs> she, all these things that happened. I can't even remember what, I, I wrote a whole thing on it. I will link it below because I don't want to say a whole bunch of things that aren't true myself right now. I just can't remember all the things. But I'll link it below where I discuss her book. In my opinion, she's a con artist. Now, does that mean she doesn't have some skill in analyzing handwriting? No, uh, I'm not even going to say that. I mean, she could have self-studied that and believe she has skill in it. I think most of the handwriting analysis stuff is a lot of rot, especially the kind that she was doing personally. But she has the right to say she's a handwriting analyst, even if she's self-trained or she's trained through some relatives or she took a course. I don't care if she says she's a handwriting analyst. That's fine. It's all the rest of the stuff she does to build herself up as this law enforcement ex expert to law enforcement, that she's the law enforcement pays a huge sums of money to do seminars, that she's got all these uh, these degrees, which I see no evidence that she has. So uh, link again, link below, check what I say there because that's where it's gonna be proper. Um, but I think she's a con artist. And one of the interesting things she did was after I did that, she wrote me this long email um, and she was, of course, upset with what I had said. But her tone to the whole email was very sweet, extremely sweet. And this is a sign of a con artist. What they do is they're still trying to con you. They still want you to believe that, hey, you're completely wrong. Pat, I don't know why you did this to me. Why would you say these things about me? They're not true. Pat, you know, I was trying to be your friend. I thought we were friends. And so it's this kind of thing. We're supposed to feel guilty. And you will feel guilty unless you realize you're still being conned. 
He's got a very sweet voice. The way he talks, it seems so nice. This is a methodology of get, getting your guard down, making you feel like you're wrong, uh, and that you, you know, how dare you say these things? How, why did you even suspect that person? That's what they do to you to get you to believe what they're saying. Uh, so let me see if I got a couple of these. Uh, oh, no, that's not what I wanted. Where is it? Where's the thing I wanted? Oh, oh here's something interesting. Uh, <laughs> this is something that Frank Ab Ab Abagnale said. It was the easiest con I ever pulled. I just read a, head, a chapter ahead of my students. Oh, he's talking about being a university professor, that it only has to be one chapter ahead of a student. Well, he actually never was a professor, so he didn't even have to do that. But part of a con is at least figuring out enough to make people believe that you know something. That's a good con, okay? And um, so you don't have to know everything. You just have to know enough. Now, I taught, once I taught a, a ballroom dance at Fred Astaire Studios, and I got hired. I was probably, I think I was 19 at the time. And I wasn't a ballroom dancer. So what they did was they brought me in and they they saw, if they, they danced me around the floor. Some the, the owner danced me around the floor. And they thought I was a pretty good dancer, which I was a good dancer, but not a ballroom dancer. But I, I, I you know, I did the, you know, I, did, I moved well. So he hired me. And I said, well, how am I supposed to teach this? He goes, well, I'll teach you three steps. All you have to teach is one. And that's what he did. So if it was a waltz, I go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And that was one. And I learned, then I learned to step forward. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And then I learned to turn. One, two, three, one, two, three. And then I get this guy who's never danced. And most of them are really slow learners. <laughs> so you go, hi, I'm going to teach you the basics. And they have no clue that you just learned that yesterday. Now, was it a con? In my opinion, yes. And at the time, I, I remember feeling a wee bit uncomfortable with this because I'm thinking, um, this guy thinks I'm an actual dancer. He thinks I'm a ballroom dancer. And he's paying me. Well, he's paying the company because I got paid crap. But he's paying as though I'm a real ballroom dancer. So, by the way, if you ever go to take ballroom dancing, tell, say you want to see that, dance, that person there, you want to see them dance. If you're going to pay them some ridiculous sum of money, $60, $100 an hour, you want to see them dance. If you're going to hire a piano teacher, you want to see if they can play the piano, okay? Because again, you can learn. I can, I can, I can pick up piano one, the book. I can learn piano one in a day. I'm not a pianist, but I can learn that book in a day or two. Then I can take a six-year-old, sit them down, and I can teach them. And of course, the parent, if they don't ask questions, thinks I'm a, pian a pianist when I'm not. Now, I'm not going to do that, but you can do that. <laughs> so just be one step ahead. So if you're so smart con artist. You learn just enough. Now, of course, you're not talking to people who know anything. This is the difference. If you're going to teach students who, let's say, let's say I'm going to teach students about psychopathology. I got everybody in the classroom and nobody in that classroom is a psychologist or a criminal profiler. They're just freshmen in college. All I have to do is read stuff the night before that Pat Brown wrote, <laughs> if I'm not Pat Brown, and I can go stand in front of the class and say that stuff. And they'll think I know crap. All I'm doing is taking it straight from the internet. So there are people who will teach on the internet, literally will teach on the internet classes they know nothing about because they just steal it from other people and teach exact amount of thing. And if there's no one to question them, they get away with it. But that's a good, that's a part of a con. So he did, so he says he did that, but actually the joke is he actually, he was such a shitty con, he never even did that. Okay. Um, now let's see. Uh, okay, well, I want, that's not the one I want. Um, okay. Oh, that's something I want to get to later. All right. I wanted to go back up here. Hold on, let's see if I can find it. Trust. Here we go. Stephen King said this. The trust of an innocent is a liar's most useful tool. People are over trusting. They assume when somebody's standing before them, they must be telling them the truth. They're not used to being conned. So if I stand before you and I say, oh, by the way, I have a house in uh, the Bahamas. And you go, oh, really? That's really nice. What? You know, oh, yeah. And I show you a picture of my house in the Bahamas. <laughs> which I just got from the internet. Um, and then if somebody's, th this is some, this is what some of the con artists who are on, you know, match.com play Tinder. They show up, they put a good picture up there and they say they have a nice house and whatever. 
they might borrow a friend's car. He, he borrowed people's cars. He also stole them. But you borrow your friend's car for the date. You roll up in your Porsche. You show, you show up the girl and you're like, hey, you know, this is my house in the Bahamas. She's all, oh, my God, I'm going to have sex with this guy because I'm going to end up with a guy who's rich and has a house in the Bahamas. Total lie. But they trust you because they're not used to being lied to. Um, this is very important. Money was just a part of it. I had fun fooling people. It was exciting and at times glamorous. And I became so good at what I was doing that it became natural for me to assume an identity other than my own. People don't understand why con artists con. They think it's always about money. It's not. Because a lot of these con artists, because they ask you, why didn't you just go do something? Just look, you know, go to college or something or get a skill. And then you could have earned a lot of money. You didn't have to con people. But the fun was in the conning. Now, on that note, I want to talk to you about, I think I've mentioned this in one of my other shows, but if you haven't seen my other show I did this on, I think I did mention this. Um, I got... I had a con artist come after me when I very first got into this business. I had started an agency to do pro bono work for families. Uh, and it was on the internet. I had my website and this woman came through. I'm going to call her Cassandra. She had a very bland name. Let's say her name was uh, something simple like, like Nancy Smith. But she had a fancy name, you see. She wanted a prettier, a fancier name than Nancy. So she, that's not her name. And it wasn't her real name. Her name, so she called us Cassandra. Okay, I'm going to make that one up. So she, she contacted me through my website, said my name is, and she had doctor before her name, Dr. Cassandra. And she was a psychologist. Uh, she had, uh, her, she told me she had a master's from John Jay College, uh, which is a big college for forensic psychology and for criminal justice. Uh, but she was across the pond. She was in, in England and she was getting her PhD through, I think it was called Ashford University at the time, which is more like one of those uh, internet online ones. But are they totally legitimate? Well, it depends. It's, it's, I don't know if that one was ever legitimate, but she told me she got, she was already finished the program. She was just waiting for it to be. That's why she put doctor before her name. I asked her, she wanted to work with my organization. And so I tried to do due diligence. Now, this is 30 years ago. So, you know, you didn't have access to what we have today. And it's still difficult to get this information. But I, she was talking to me and she was brilliant, by the way. She knew her psychology. She Whatever she had studied before she talked to me, she had studied a lot of. She wasn't a dumbass like him, in my opinion. She really knew her stuff. She was brilliant. Still say that to this day. I think her IQ was skyrocketed. So I asked for, I wanted to see the paperwork from John Jay College. She sent it to me. She had the paperwork. Her name was on it, master's degree, looked like John Jay College. Uh, I, can't, I found, She did have the stuff from, I think, Ashford University as well. Um, then I, she had a place she was working for, which was a legitimate place where she was working as a psychologist. I called them, called them, talked to the boss. They said, oh, she's fabulous. And she was only coming to work for me as a volunteer, but she just wanted to help victims. That was her thing. So we started a relationship and she was just really good. Um, and then I went to write, oh, here's, here's the picture I was looking for. I went to write on the right side, you'll see Killing for Sport. That was my very first book. Um, I want to write this book about uh, psychopaths. And I had already written a good portion of the book, but because she had joined my organization, uh, I thought, wouldn't it be better if she wrote the book with me, even though I'd written most of it, you know, join, she would join me in writing the book. That would be a profiler and a psychologist. Um, I was willing to share the money. I didn't really care. I wanted this book to be successful. I thought our teamwork would be successful. She agreed. And she had, by that had time, had moved to another state, back to the U.S. into a specific state. She had a house on the beach. Her husband was, had a very, high, very good job. Uh, she had one child. She said, why don't you come out and stay with me on the, at the beach and we'll work on the book. I said, okay. So I'd already talked to the, I already had the publisher and the publisher, I told him. Who, uh, so they'd already put together the picture and her name was on it. Went out there, spent the month with her. Now, mind you, uh, so I'm spending the month with her. I'm, I'm starting to see things that make me suspicious. Oh, by the way, at that point that I went out there, she was the um, principal of a public elementary school. So again, legitimate job that must have done due diligence to hire her, right? Except I'm at her house and I'm starting to see things that just don't add up to me, things that started bugging me. 
So at a certain point, I was able to find, she must have been out of the house, <clears throat> her real name. Once I found her real name, I was able to do a whole bunch of research. Turns out she never went to John Jay College. There was a forged document. She never had even been to college. She had only been a high school graduate. She, she claimed she was at a certain point when I started asking questions, she started said she was in a witness protection program because she, after she got a psychology degree from the bachelor's program, she had gone to work at a, a federal penitentiary or something like that. And they, she had gotten targeted by cartels or whatever. And they put her in a witness protection program for her safety. That's why her name changed. Big fat lie. She, she worked there as a volunteer. <laughs> she was never in a witness protection program. She, so I found out all this stuff. And just as I started grilling her on certain things, she managed to <clears throat> suddenly get a brain tumor and she would go to appointments and everything and even had shaved part of her head. She got a brain tumor and that's why she had to leave her job as the, <laughs> as a principal of the school because of her brain tumor. But apparently they were finding out about her. And also there was something about some money that was stolen. And so I got back to this, my, to Maryland and I sent her an email and I said, here's what I know about you. And I listed a whole bunch of things. I said, you have 24 hours, get your name off my website, get your name off my book, disappear. Want nothing to do with you. And it will be connected with you. Other than that, I'm taking you down. It didn't take her 24 hours. I think within 12 hours, she vanished. Never heard from her again. So <laughs> she was smarter than this guy. She was really good because she actually loved to read. She read a ton of stuff. So she, she could have been a doctor of psychology. She could have been a great criminal profiler. She could have been a lawyer. She was also very good, very good with uh, website work. So she fixed her things on my website. That's probably how she made counterfeit stuff from John Jay College. She was that freaking good. But she could have just done this the legitimate way. And she, I think she could have ended up being famous as far as, you know, she could have been all television shows and all that. But she was a con artist. And I believe the reason that she didn't do it the right way was because she loved conning people. She loved developing an entire story and having people ooh and ah and be all good. She loved pulling the wool over on people. So does he. I think Moselle does the same thing. I think she loves creating the story and having people believe it. That's more exciting than working your butt off to get where you need to get. So that's one thing she does. And here's something else I want to point out to people. One of the things that he did, which is why people fall for a lot of this stuff is, first of all, a very friendly they always talk about you more than they talk about themselves. And don't we all want that? Don't we complain when people, all they do is talk about themselves and never talk about you. They never, like, they want to tell you about their kids, their vacation, their job, but they never ask you a dang thing. You just have to, they rattle on for an hour and you're sitting there going, and they could care less who you are, what you do. We all complain about that, but that's not what psychopaths do. That's not what con artists do. They talk about you. A lot of times. Now, I'm not saying they don't have their stories that they're putting out there, but a lot of times they will change the subject really quickly and talk about you. Why? Because that way they don't have to give up information about themselves. And they make you think, oh my God, the person's interested in me. And they will also, not only will they show interest in you, but anything you mention that you like, they will like to. So if you say, you know, you really enjoy traveling, guess what? Oh my God, I love traveling too. And then they say, where have you been? Oh, oh, I love that place. Because everybody likes somebody who has some, they have something in common with. So they will, they will butter you up for all the things you like doing, they like doing too. And therefore, you also you feel comfortable. You feel like they could be your best friend. They want you to think you're, you're their best friend. That's how they play you. And once you get pulled into that and you think, wow, you know, this person really likes me. They're they're so open, <laughs> you know, but a lot of times people just don't see the other part of it. Now, depends how good they are. Now, in my case with Cassandra, she was good. I mean, she, she, I mean, she had people, I mean, she had, I, I, I did, I did do due diligence as much as I could at the time. And I got the paperwork and I called her, I called up the, 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 the agent place she worked at. 
And then she got that job, uh, say, in the, in the public school system as a principal, not just as a teacher's aide, as a principal, you also assume other people do due diligence. Now, here's where some of the problem comes in. If people don't do due diligence in trying to re reassure you who you are, then they will play into that. And from that point on, you give that person credibility. And I probably that's, I did, I believe I did do due diligence as much as I could at the time. But because people saw her attached to me, they must have thought she was a reason, was an honest person and wasn't a con artist. So what he's saying, which is interesting, his claim that he went and worked for the doc, the hospitals and the, and the, and the attorney general's office and, and the, and the, and the, and the uh, colleges. The funny thing about that is he had nobody in the media was talking, calling up those places and saying, did he work there? They weren't doing due diligence. They were so happy with the story. They never called to say, Hey, did he work at your hospital? Come on now. They should have done that. And they didn't, they should have called the attorney general's office. Have you ever heard of this dude, but they didn't do it. Why didn't they do it? Why? Why would they not bother to check out his past before they put him on the Johnny Carson show? What before they do a book, before they do a movie? Why did none of those people do due diligence and check out his past? Because it was pretty easy. Because all they had to do was call up and they say, look, we're from where we're, we're, we're their lawyers could simply call up. You know, you're going to put out a book. Have the lawyer call up the attorney general down there in Louisiana and say, hey, did this guy ever work for you? And the guy says, no, you dumped the book because he's a liar. Not just a con artist, but a complete liar about his cons. But they didn't do any of that. And so I'm going to get to why didn't the media do what they're supposed to do? But just to wrap this part up, I'll check some of your comments. Think about this. When you're dealing with people... Con artists are slick, they're friendly, they smile, they talk about you, they, they, they tell a good story, but they move quickly so that you don't get too much of the details. And sometimes it is very hard to determine if they're telling the truth or not. But if you're gonna hook up with them in business or in a relationship, do as much as you can to find this stuff out. And one thing that we're afraid to do, and I, I have to admit, I was this is something I was afraid of, Get permission, if necessary, from that person in a letter form to check with their previous employer, to check with the college, because a lot of times they will not release information. They, they're afraid of getting sued. So a lot of times you just can't call up a college and say, did this person graduate from there? You can't do it. So how do you know? I can't remember how I actually found out she didn't go to John Jay College. I figured it out, but I can't remember whether I finally did get, get through to them and somebody was willing to admit to me that she never attended. But a lot of times they will not get that information unless you get a, a letter with their signature on it to give you permission. Same thing with the past employers. They have to say, yes, you have the right to talk to this person. So they make it very hard to do check, checks, uh, background checks. Um, now, if, as far as criminal, criminal uh, checks go, depends on the state you're in in the United States. In Maryland, I can look up every name on the Maryland site. But Virginia is a pain in the butt, and so is D.C., and there's some states you, you, you can only go, you have to go literally go there and go to each courthouse to find anything out. So it's ridiculous. So people can hide a lot of times at criminal records, depending, um, especially if they've got a really simple name. It just goes so many of them, you can't even find them. Um, but finding out what the person actually went to a college, really worked that work. These things sometimes are hard to find. But if you're going to actually marry some sucker, you know, you have every right to know everything, where they lived, if they have a criminal record and who they work for, and if they really do have a college degree, you have every right to know that stuff. And if they don't want to tell you or shying away from it or say, oh, you just don't trust me, say, correct. I, I don't know you well enough to know if I should trust you or not. And if you, if you want me to trust you, this is what you need to do. If you don't want to do it, take a hike. So let me go to your comments and then I'll go to why the media are bigger con artists than anybody else. Um, uh, not at all true. It's easier for them to believe him, even though they shouldn't have. Not true. This is why I'm going to get to on the media thing. Um, let's see. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if you're talking about me, um, but 
I don't know if talked about somebody else's uh, due diligence, but I, I, I finally figured it out. But man, I mean, I could have, that could have been a big, big, huge disaster. Um, ah, I love it, Joe. What's the best way to sell a lie? Get the media to sell it for you. Absolutely true. 100% true. It's a shame, but true. Um, I guess you can't believe anyone or anything anymore. I don't know that we, no, we may never have been able to believe people as much as we think. And even the stuff from the past, and I'll get into that, uh, the, even then, the media was always a problem. Um, <laughs> I feel bad I even watched that movie again. And it is, it is, a, it is a fun movie. I will give, I'll give them that. I'm not saying they did a bad job making the movie. It's just a bunch, bunch of garbage. Just, that's all. <laughs> I love that. People loving shows. Let's see. Um, all right. So let's say... Uh, Oh, you have the opposite problem. <laughs> it's hard for me to believe anything. Well, that, you know, that's a sad thing, isn't it? You should be able to believe people. When you can't believe people, it's a, it's a, it's a shame. It truly is a shame. And we don't want to have to walk around life not believing people but and not trusting people. But I always say, you know, I will trust you if I, as much, if you better, the only way I'm going to trust you is if, if you prove it to me. And if you're not willing to prove it to me that you're a trustworthy person, I'm, I'm perfectly willing not to trust you. <laughs> you know? Anyway, let me get to the media aspect of it. All right. So let me go back in time. Uh, I'm, if you haven't seen it yet, I'll put the link below. I did a 10 part series. Uh, this is the introduction to the 10 part series, the murder of Cleopatra. And I wrote the book, the murder of Cleopatra. And even back 2000 years ago, the lies were being told. And what's really frustrating is Cleopatra in my opinion, all the evidence points is she was murdered by Octavian, uh, who had her in cap captured after he got into Alexandria. However, all the stories have gone down for years that she she died by a, by the cobra. She died. She's committed suicide by snake. And I did the Discovery Channel show, The Mysterious Death of Cleopatra. I went to Egypt and I proved the snake didn't do it. And since then, all the historians had gotten rid of the snake. Now, prior to my doing the show. All the historians said she committed suicide by snake. I mean, almost across the board. I can't even, like all of them. Then after I did the show, all of them said she didn't die by snake. Now they're still saying she died by suicide because they're not going for the murder thing yet. Where's the truth? So, and then of course, I don't mention that I got rid of the snake. They just say they got rid of the snake. <laughs> they, they, my name got tossed out of the uh, equation because I'm not a historian or an Egyptologist, and they didn't particularly like the criminal profile that came in and got rid of the snake when they're the people that should have gotten rid of it. True, they should have. But the, the amount of lies told over the years, uh, the story of Cleopatra is so ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And in my 10-part series and in my book, I put the evidence out that the most of the story is nonsense. The stories about Julius Caesar and Mark Antony and the, 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 the Actium, uh, Battle, all of this stuff is garbage. And I believe Octavian, once he got rid of her, probably he got a historian to write, like Plutarch got to write a bunch of nonsense because it supported his story and what he wanted people to believe. But through the years, historians have simply repeated this story over and over and over again without even stopping to question. If they're going to do due diligence, why aren't the historians looking at this stuff going, that doesn't make sense? Why? Because they were perfectly happy with the story. It takes less work to tell the story over again, not rock the boat. And people love to read the same stupid story again. My book has made almost no money, by the way. Uh, I got paid, to just so, so you can just say how things work. I got paid a $10,000 advance. I spent, well, $5,000 of that straight, straight away going to Egypt and, and for a month and paying my airfare and doing my research work. I bought tons and tons of books to study about a whole bunch of stuff. So I'm going to pretty much say by the time that was done, I'm lucky if I made a couple thousand on it. But another author came out with a book uh, and she got, she got a top, top publisher. She probably made half a million. And she got, I, th I think she even got a, an option for the, the movie that was supposed to be with um, Angelina Jolie. My, my book didn't get it. Her book did. She even took some of the stuff from my book. We don't talk about that right now. <clears throat> That's in the series. But it's like, 
But she basically told the same story with a bunch of fancy, kind of fancy words because that's a story everybody liked. So they're happy with it. So what happens in the media is that they go with what makes the money. The other one, which I can say is very frustrating to me, is that um, I did the show on the Superbikes murder down in South Carolina. And Todd Kolop, who was a serial killer, who was caught for having kidnapped and murdering people. And he then confessed to doing a mass murder in a bike shop of four people. He's a serial killer, but he, commit, he confessed to a mass murder. And the police said he, he gave information that only the police and the killer would know, that all the people in the motorbike shop were shot in the forehead. And that was an absolute lie because I, I worked on that case. I went down to South Carolina, I spent a week down there. I saw all the information. I have copies of the autopsy reports and not one of them was shot in the forehead. I went to the news networks. These are the news networks I work for. <laughs> I mean, these are people I know. 48 hours, 60 minutes. I know these the producers there. I went to the producers and said, hey, this is Pat Brown. I worked that case. Tom Colop is lying. And the police chief, uh, Sheriff, Sheriff Wright, Sheriff Wright is lying. And they're giving him a plea deal because they're trying to shut down that case. And it's a lie. He didn't commit the crime. Here's the evidence. Couldn't get one person to even respond to me. Why is that? When I had the evidence, because they love the story. They'd already gone out with the blessing of Sheriff Wright to give this story. They told the whole story of Todd Kolop because he's a creepy dude and they got to do videos of him and they got to see his confession on camera and they ran with it because it made money, tons of it. And they sure as heck weren't going to let Pat Brown roll in and muck up their, well, now we got to admit it was not even true. So they just dumped it. Well, there were journalists and you'll see this in the book. If you read the full book, the hoax book, there were a couple of journalists who worked their little buns off at the beginning of time when he was starting to lie about everything. And he was starting to get on these shows. They started doing a real investigation. They wrote for their, they managed a couple of them. They got turned down a lot. They, people didn't want, the, the publisher didn't want to hear the story. But the, a couple of them at least got local paper to put the story out. And it never got any further. Because even though there were bigger, you know, these days, everybody, you know, the media industry steals everybody else's stuff. You know, one person does the story and then the next day there's 500 media outlets who tell the same story because they just steal it as they got that 24 hour news cycle. So they didn't want it, though, because it ruined the story that they already like. The coolest con artist ever is amazing guy. He's on Johnny Carson. Woohoo! You know, they didn't want to ruin the story. Now, let's look at due diligence for producers of his show. All the producers, producers of all the shows he's ever been on, did they even check anything out? And here's what I can absolutely tell you. No, because there are people who accuse me of having gotten on television because the producers of the shows didn't bother to check out my background. And they're totally correct. I wish I could say that the people in television brought me on the first time, the second time, for the next 3,000 appearances because they did check out my background. And the answer to that is they never did. Now, some people, it's kind of funny because some people say, well, you know, Pat Brown, she only got a liberal arts degree. And I'm like, why do they keep saying that? I went over to Wikipedia and I found out that's what it did say there. I didn't write the Wikipedia page. So I actually just went back and corrected and put in my, my, my master's degree from, a, from a Boston University. But, but obviously, because that was what was on Wikipedia, Nobody ever, nobody from any of the television industries ever bothered to look into my history. They saw my website and they invited me straight onto the show. And because the first time I did a show, they liked me. I could speak well on camera. They thought, oh, she's really cool. The next person. And then the next person, next person. And I just started working like crazy on television because I became popular and everybody started believing I must be somebody because I was on so many shows. Now I became somebody, but I don't know that I was that much of a somebody at the time. No. So, yeah, they don't do due diligence. 
I know that from personal experience. And I was so lucky they didn't for me. <laughs> if, if they maybe had done due diligence, I might have said, well, you know, she's an up and coming criminal profiler. I mean, she's got a website. She's obviously done studies. She's real, she seems pretty smart. But at the time I did start uh, on television, I did only have a liberal arts degree. I had studied, as I pointed out many times, I had already studied 400 books on the subject. I had done massive amounts of study to become a criminal profile. And I'd also done seminars and so forth. And I was already working on cases, but I didn't go through a traditional program because they didn't exist. So later on, yes, I, start, I, I created the first criminal profiling program in the country for Excelsior College later on. Um, and I got my master's degree, which to me was kind of super simple because I'd already done so much work in the field. I mean, it was like, eh, you know, um, that was much easier than the 400 books I studied and read. Um, but I wasn't FBI and I wasn't law enforcement and I wasn't independent criminal profiling. Yes. Did I self-proclaim that? Probably true. I did. I decided I wanted to go in this field. I studied the field. I opened up my agency. Was I a liar and a con artist? No. The difference was I never lied. I never lied to anybody. I was who I was. I was open and honest about it. I had a blog. I put the stuff right on the blog. I mean, I never lied to anybody. He was a liar. And they didn't care. With me, they just didn't bother to do what they should have done. They liked me, and that was that was good enough for them. And it wasn't until, now the first book, Killing for Sport, they didn't do due diligence on that. They just printed it. With the second book, The Profiler, that's when they did due diligence. And they actually wanted to see, make sure that when I talked about cases, I'd actually work those cases. And I had to forward, I say, ton of, ton of paperwork. Um, they did do due, due diligence. I'll give Hyperion credit on that. They did. Um, but this guy, they didn't care. His story was good. And once he got on to tell the truth, it all snowballed from there. They're like, well, to tell the truth had him on, so we'll have him on. So we'll have him on the Johnny Carson. We'll have him on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Once John, once he's at the top, Johnny Carson, damn, I didn't, I didn't even get that show. <laughs> you know, they got him on Johnny Carson. After that, they didn't care anymore. They, the book was written. They didn't care how much of that was fake. But the, the media doesn't care about the truth. They care about the story making them a crap load of money. Or the person that shows up on TV making them money. They'll put anybody up there that gets viewers, that gets clicks, that gets whatever they want to get, which is money, which is absolutely money. So if you're going to go believe what you see on TV, believe what you read in books, you better be careful to find out how much of this stuff has been vetted, whether you can see where the information comes from. Most of the time, for example, when I did uh, the Cleopatra book, I have a very long list of the bibliography and all my footnotes. And I explain every single thing that I put in there. I say, this is why I say this. This is what supports this. So you don't have to just believe Pat Brown because Pat Brown is Pat Brown. You can see if Pat Brown is making sense and if Pat Brown has support by any evidence. But a lot of stuff is just written and people just make up stuff and they put it in there. And people say, oh, this person's a well-known author. They must be telling the truth. Really? Because all they had to do is get that foot in the door because the media liked them. And from then on, you may not be able to trust anything they say or that the media says. So be very, very aware of that. So this guy wasn't even a good con artist at the time. He wasn't. He was so shabby. He, all he did was float some bad checks, steal, some, steal a couple people's cars, talk them out of some money, put on a fake outfit, a fake a uniform, and make people think he was somebody so he could get a free, few free rides on, on a plane. That's not a great con artist. But once they picked him up for to tell the truth and didn't care what his background was, he realized he had a this was truly the con he was going to play. Finally, he could lie about all his, his little shabby things. He could change everything, make a fictionalized story, and he would become super famous. He was right about that. So he's a good storyteller. But he's not really good. He wasn't good at committing the cons he committed. He's just a great storyteller. And if the media gave him that support, since media, a con artist with him, he went, everybody goes home happy, right? 
all the all the all the, they they made a fortune off the book. They made a fortune off the the movie. He made a fortune off the book and the movie. Now he's living in this stupid wife. I'm sorry, lady. I'm going to call you stupid because you're living with a psychopath and you know better. And your poor kids have to know their daddy's a psychopath. It's a pathologically lying psychopath con artist, and he's never ever changed. He's still what he was when he was a teenager. And he started as a teenager by stealing his father's credit cards. So he wasn't a good guy back then either. So he's a piece of crap. Oh, let me show you the, let me show you the final picture and I'll go to your comments. My final picture on this guy is that. That's what he really is. That's a true picture of Frank. I can't say the guy's name, Ab Abagnale. <laughs> Abagnale, it's very hard to say his name. Frank Abagnale, that's him as a teen. In his 20s, now he's probably, what, 60s, 70s? That's him. Just a low-life con artist that got the bigger con artist, the media, to make him what he is today, which is living a sweet life, let me tell you. Crime does pay. Lying does pay. And having the media lie for you, that really pays. Now, let me just check some of your comments. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just... Just call him Frank. Yeah, it is easy just to call him that. Like, no, call him a piece of crap. <laughs> so I'd be happy to call him that. He looks, <laughs> he looks like a bag of nails. He's not a, he, he, I admit, he looks better when he's older. You know, he looks way better than when he's older. Um, Jill says, uh, it's like you tell us to confirm facts rather than interpretation of facts. Yes, but you know, Yes, it, but it's also sometimes hard to know what the facts are because people tell you their facts, but how do you know their facts? And a lot of a lot of places will tell you this is what a fact is when it's not a fact, and and that's that's what then it, then that keeps snowballing too. So it's sometimes very hard to get to the truth of anything. And when you're talking about, uh, as I say, the person who you know the the winner, the winner is the one who can then make. Uh, they, they can create the history. So what you'll see over time is that depending on who is in power, uh, whether it be a country, uh, who's in power politically, or who's in power in Hollywood, or who's in power wherever, wherever it is, and within, within, uh, within uh, academia, who's ever in power in these places, they start controlling things. So when things change in academia and politics and whatever, then you have somebody starting to rewrite history and throw out other pieces of information. Sometimes they're improving it because they actually are finding out that they were lied to before, but sometimes they throw away the truth and create new laws. And so anytime in, in life, when you read history, you always wonder, how much of this crap is true? <laughs> uh, oh, you, Eriberry says, I saw Abagnale giving a talk and he does exhibit superficial charm, narcissism, and a lack of remorse. Well, at least you caught the uh, narcissism and lack of remorse along with the charm. So that that's useful. Yeah, Fr Frank the Con. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, uh, no vetting. Another reason to believe or not believe. Very much true. Bookers without ethics. You know, a lot of the bookers, uh, the problem is they're given a very short period of time to book. This is one of the problems we have with 24-7 type of stuff. Uh, they the rush that they are in to get you on the show before somebody else gets you on the show, or because in my case, the first time I was on television, it's because their guest guest reneged and they needed somebody in the chair in the next, I think it was the next hour. And I was, they, they found my website and found I was close to Washington DC. And they just told me to hop a taxi, get down there and just threw me in the chair, told me to do my makeup on the way. They didn't know who I was except outside of the website. And I raced in and they pulled me into the chair, mic'd me up, put my earpiece in and the show started like that. And they're like, hello, uh, we're here with criminal profiler, Pat Brown. And I was like, hi, well, thank you. Whoever it was, I forgot who his show was. Um, I said, oh, thank you. Thank you for having me here. And I went on, finished it. And when I finished, there was a message waiting for me. It said, you rock, you rock. We want you on tomorrow. And I started getting calls from all the networks because those bookers are trying to grab me because I thought I was good. Now they wanted me for their show. They're in such a rush to get so many people on so quickly that they don't do due diligence. Now, maybe back in the day when we only had three channels um, and they had just a news time <clears throat> or a special, <clears throat> sorry, news program, 
then for that news program, they might prepare for it for quite a while. Um, and therefore, they, they, had, they had more knowledge of, they had more time to make sure they knew who they were putting on there. But in this world today, yeah, especially since they don't pay anybody, you know, they don't pay people to be on their shows. Uh, they're just, they'll take whoever is willing to show up, you know. And now that, oh, and now they don't have to send a limo for you anymore. Now, since they just have uh, Zoom, they'll just call you up and say, hey, we're going to, can you be on the show in uh, 30 minutes? And you, they just, they just throw you on Zoom. They don't have to, they don't even have to pay for a studio anymore. They don't have to pay for the makeup and hair. They don't have to pay for the limo. They get a free, per, a person for free without paying any money. Out. They are scooping up the cash to these days, really scooping up the cash. It's insanity. Ah. Uh, <laughs> oh my god yes you did witness me denying betsy the booker the other night that's true only i said that incorrectly last the other night because yeah betsy called me from msnbc very nice person uh she's booked me for years and um and i said well you know i don't do any free work i don't do free work anymore that wasn't quite accurate the diff the thing was they never paid me to be on television but some people know my story i'll tell it real quick again since they didn't pay me or don't don't pay any of us, they call us guests instead of commentators, even if we're on 20 to 40 hours a week, um, people do it for just a publicity and um, they won't pay. That I decided I couldn't work for free, so I developed the Always Available Transport Service. So I told them I wouldn't take their limos anymore because they they were they would, would show up late and it stressed me out. So I only used this one service and they all agreed and they all paid this one service for me to come in. And it was just me driving myself to the studio and back. So I got paid $80 an hour to leave the house until I got back. <laughs> so $80 an hour, but they never figured it out. So I did this for over a decade until they went to zoom. And then I'm like, well, I can't do it now. And they're like, why not? I'm like, cause you're not hiring my car service anymore, my transport service. And I'm not going to do it for free. They're like, why, why do you need your transport service? I said, because I'm the transport service. You pay me $80 an hour. And they all laughed. They laughed hysterically. They thought it was, they thought it was, they're like, oh my God, that's brilliant. That was how I got paid. But once I couldn't use that method to get paid, I'm like, I'm not working for free. So, except for rare occasions. I did, I did do the one recently, uh, the Dan Abrams one recently, uh, because I worked with the family, the Rachel Moran case. And so I was, I went on there to, to put the profile up. So yes. On a rare occasion, yes. So that's that's how. <laughs> no, <laughs> now that's a cool, that's a con. Oh, wait a minute now. It's not, wasn't a con. Now you have to see, you have to see. It. This is what you call spin. <laughs> I mean, caught at the end of the show. <laughs> Hope everybody's gone. No, this was a spin. What I developed and I had, it was a legitimate company called Always available transport service. I did not call it a limo service because I did not have a limo. I didn't even call it a car service because it, sometimes I actually didn't use a car. I walked from one studio to the other studio. I transported myself from here to there and from there to here. I transported myself. I never said, I never said anything more than I said, I have, I, this is the transport company I use. And they said, great. And I said, this is how much they charge. And that transport company was so good, I was never, ever late. They thought it was the best transport company ever. And I was just really thankful they didn't ask me to, to have other people use the transport company. <laughs> so I officially did not lie. I just wanted to use this method of transporting myself to the studio and back. <laughs> it was kind of close to a con, but I was totally honest. Never said it was a limo service or even a car service. So, yep. <laughs> but I had, you know, I, they, I, I had, it was, it was like a year or two before I started doing commentary work that they had stopped paying people for doing it. Now they have a few people you'll see like, um, uh, there's been a couple people. There was a, oh, what's his name? Um, geez, it's been a while. They've had a couple people in the past that have stayed on who were commentators who got paid a, a regular salary. But about the time, about a year or two before I came on, they realized they didn't have to pay people. They would just tell them they're getting publicity. And so that's what they changed to. So most everybody you see today, except for the four-star general or something, you know, like that four-star general on the Greta Sam Van Susteren, I'm pretty sure he got paid um, people like that. But uh, generally speaking, 
everybody who's on there is on there for publicity to show show their you know get their name out there to get the YouTube channel promoted to get their books promoted and they're told you're getting publicity well it's true you do get some publicity but I want to be paid for the time and effort I put in and my expert opinion so if you're going to make me do research and then spend the time doing the show I want to be paid like every other person on your show the host gets paid you know the producer gets paid the tech people get paid, the cameraman gets paid, and I get crap. And all the people you have in front of the camera don't get paid. Documentaries do the same thing. They don't want to pay you. We gonna we want you to be in our documentary. I say, how much you paying? Oh, we don't pay the people in our documentary. I say, well, and I'm not showing up. I deserve to get a paycheck. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine this in any other field? Oh, we'd like you to teach at our school, but we're not going to pay you. We'd like to be a doctor at the hospital, but we're not going to pay you. I mean... <laughs> But that's television for you. Television, television. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, everybody says, like the Kendrick Johnson. Uh, I was sucked into that whole conspiracy of he was murdered and didn't dig deep enough. <clears throat> yeah, it's, you know, and it's very hard to know where you're going to get proper information. They had that documentary, right? The documentary claims that he was murdered. And you get all these people on there saying he was murdered. And shouldn't, shouldn't you believe a documentary? Well, these days, no, because the documentary doesn't care about being, you know, uh, uh, unbiased. The documentary, like Making a Murderer, is 100% biased because that's the story they want to tell. And they don't care. They know. I swear to God, those producers of Making a Murderer know darn well Stephen Avery is guilty, guilty, guilty. But they saw the big payday. And they were right. One of the biggest things ever put out by Netflix made them a fortune. Made people's careers all based on a lie. So, yeah, it's, it's sad. It's sad when you can't trust people. But, you know, you do want to be aware of that at least and try to, try, to, try to find out, you know, as much information as you can if you're trying, if you're going to believe something. Uh, try to find reputable people to pay it, listen to at least that will try to support things with evidence or at least an explanation. <laughs> um, be very cautious of stuff out there. Yeah. How... Uh, um, not of being not by not being paid, a lot of good ones have fall, fall, fallen by the wayside. Yes, there are a lot of there's many people who say, Look, this is ridiculous, I'm, I'm not doing this if I don't get paid. Um, and you know, and a lot of times people aren't even expecting a huge salary, it's just you know, you, you, you I could not work for the networks for all those years, it was 15 years. If I work for them 20 to 40 hours a week, and that's on air, I'm not talking about going back and forth and stuff. I can't work another job. If I can't work another job, I need to be paid by that job. It's one thing if you do one show a month. Oh, you know, one time this month they asked me to be on TV. Isn't that exciting? Yeah, you could do that. But I was on like Nancy Grace three times a week and they wouldn't pay me. I got a mug. <laughs> you know, uh, that's ridiculous to have me on that often. And I would do the whole lineup for HLN. I do Prime News, and then I do Jane Velez Mitchell, then I do Nancy Grace, and then Dr. Drew, uh, or uh, at the time it was um, uh, also, what's her face? Um, I blanked. But a four, that's four hours of work right there, and I have to go to the studio, and i got to come back from the studio. That's a whole day's work, and I have to study this stuff. So for eight hours of work, I get paid zero. But always available transport service. <laughs> that's why I showed up. You know, because I had to, I had to get myself an income to be able to continue on. And uh, so people, you don't understand the same thing with YouTube. People are like, I you know, well, you just do YouTube. It's, it's, you know, it's fine if you just, you know, you love doing it. I, I do love doing YouTube, but I also end up doing YouTube 40 hours a week because that's how much time it takes to not only do the shows, but do the research for the shows to answer questions. Da, 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 da. It's a lot of work. If I don't do if I don't do 40 hours of if I'm not doing if I'm doing 40 hours of YouTube. I'm not doing 40 hours of something else. So yes, you have to earn a living. Even if it's not huge, you still have to earn a living. <laughs> so, you know, um, but that's television. So a lot of good people don't get paid for television, but that piece of garbage, Frank, the con man, and, the, and, his, and his con team called the media, he walks away with the sweet deal. All for being just this little piece of garbage that ran around doing these crappy little cons, which weren't even they weren't even good. It's just the story that he made up that was good. And so unbelievable. If you actually watch, catch me if you can. I'm watching that just going, this is stupid. 
how did anybody believe this? The part where he's supposedly in the, in the airplane and he goes into the bathroom and then he, he escapes through the toilet. Well, in the movie, they showed it through the sink into the fuselage, I guess. And then somehow he gets out of there and is able to jump onto the tarmac and run away. Get out of here. <laughs> I'm laughing. and going, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. There are so many stupid things. I'm like, there's no way he would have gotten away with any of this crap. So it was totally an unbelievable movie to me. It was well done as far as entertaining, but I didn't believe any of it, even if I not didn't know any better. So but nobody cared how ridiculous his stories were. And if they, they if they even they probably knew they were fake, didn't care because they saw they could sell it. So let's say who is the bigger con artist? Frank Abagnale or the media people? And in my opinion, they should be all, they should all end up in jail for fraud. But that'll never happen. <laughs> so anyway, that's my thoughts on all of this. I'm glad you were here. <sighs> but fascinating. The whole thing is very fascinating, but very, very upsetting as well. So anyway, thank you for being here, guys. Um, yes, that's true. There's a logic and common sense. Just help out, don't they? <laughs> So thank you for being here. If you're here for the first time again, and or if you've been coming to my channel and you're not subscribing, do subscribe because um, it's important for the algorithm because YouTube is not necessarily nice about the algorithm. And starting at, I think it's in a couple days, they're going to a new, they're going to a new advertising method to help out the small people, the small channels. I'm going to guarantee you I'm about, I'm about to lose 50% of my income because I don't think that's true at all. I don't think I'm going to get a deal out of that one. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm glad you liked the show. Good night. Good night, everybody. Um, yeah, this was a, this was a, it was, it was interesting to read about everything. I can't, I said, I couldn't get through the whole book because it was, it was like, I can't read more about how many wrong things this guy has done and how ridiculous it all is, but a good, very good book. So do read that book. Okay. That's the hoax book, not his book. Don't give him any money. So, uh, yes, hit like, that's always nice too. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for being here, everyone. And I will be back for the hangout during the week. And, um, yeah. So check that out. Check out, join Patreon. That's a great way to support the channel as well. Bye-bye.